introduction, Rana, and I'm very excited to be here. My first time in India. Um, this is uh, meant to be an interactive uh, session, so um, I encourage you to, uh, to uh, hold questions. I'm going to run through a few slides and then we are going to reserve enough time to, uh, to answer your questions afterwards. If you uh, don't understand something I'm saying, please uh, raise your hands and we can already interrupt during the uh, slides also. Okay, so this is um, a little bit large, the audience, but we can certainly um, make this quite interactive. So, uh, my name is Bernd Pulvera, I'm the uh, chief editor of the Envo Journal, and, uh, which is a uh, European collector biology organization, and I am uh, responsible uh, for all four journals at this um, at Envo, basically, which you can see at the bottom here, the Envo Journal, Envo Reports, Envo Molecular Medicine, and Molecular Systems Biology. But what I'm going to say um, affects all scientific journals, and I'm not going to well, on our journals particularly, so it should apply to wherever you want to publish your work. Um, my talk is really about research integrity, but it's uh, going beyond that. It's trying to um, emphasize uh, the importance of sharing data in a way that is reproducible and usable by others, and that's an absolutely crucial element in, in communicating science. So let me see if this slides work. So um, why are we even um, publishing? work at all. Um, originally this uh, was of course to archive our work and uh, to make sure that it's, uh, it's kept for posterity. Uh, but recently this has really changed and uh, we are archiving our data in databases and other online forms and publishing really has turned, in, has turned into a different role which is what I would like to call academic currency. And this is in fact going to be discussed much more in the uh, next session which we'll have straight after this. Uh, so this is uh, sometimes called the publish or perish paradigm and uh, journals, and you are under uh, immense pressure nowadays to publish at all costs. And this is why this whole um, ethics issue has arisen in the first place. It's, an, it's very important that you're aware of it. I'm uh, going to come back in the, in, in the next session, actually, to this thing I'm showing at the top here, which is called uh, DORA, which is the San Francisco Declaration for Research Assessment. Let me see if this pointer works. But on the top right you can see um, DORA, which, which is something I'm going to explain a little bit later. But it's uh, crucial that we come back from this, uh, from this current uh, mode of, of sharing at all costs in, in the best scientific journals we can find to ensuring that we share reproducible science again. Okay, let me see if the... Could you move forward the slide, please? One. Maybe I have to point into... Oh, okay. Great. So, so why, why is it important um, to, to, to share scientific information? It's not just so that our colleagues uh, find the science reliable. It's because your research um, may have an impact on human health and on society. And this is a great example, I think, uh, to show where, um, a, a case where journals did not do a good job, actually, at ensuring the scientific integrity was preserved. You probably all know it. It's uh, a paper that claimed that the MMR, the measles, mumps um, vaccine, triple vaccine would, uh, would cause autism, would be causally linked to autism in children. And this was uh, published by a young doctor in the hospital where my children were born, actually, in London. Um, and it turned out to be a paper that was both uh, badly executed, because it was based on non-randomly selected children on a far too small sample size of 12, 12 children, and it later turned out to be a completely uh, ethically um, questionable study. But it took the journal where it was published, The Lancet, actually 12 years to retract this paper from 1998 to 2010. And in the meantime, uh, this, was, uh, this single paper was, was taken as a flagship by the vaccine doubting uh, community, which is quite a large um, movement actually, especially in the United Kingdom and, and uh, the United States. Um, to, to really um, emphasize at the political level that, that vaccination should be stopped. And in certain uh, states in the United States, but also in the UK, vaccination rates 
for these uh, very curable disease or preventable diseases have now fallen below herd immunity, and these diseases are coming back. And this can really be traced back to just a handful of papers, and in particular this paper. And uh, what's dramatic is that this paper has been retracted already in 2010, and yet it still is, is cited by uh, people like um, this person on the bottom left here who has tweeted no less than 12 tweets defending this work um, and saying this is a conspiracy against uh, good science. So, so this is why your work can have an impact well beyond our immediate community and beyond your peers. Uh, what can journals do to prevent this sort of thing? Um, you can see that the retraction took far too long in this case, so we have to move faster. But we also have to um, improve things more systemically. And, uh, we, and I'm going to show you a couple of things that we've done at the EMBO uh, publications to improve the editorial process, and other journals are doing uh, similar things, so things are getting better. But we also need to um, have a more robust way to check the information before we publish it, beyond peer review itself. And we have to find ways to publish uh, better papers in a more uh, modern way, um, which, which I'm going to try to illustrate very briefly. Could you move to the next slide, please? OK. So, so the, on the first point, what can we do in terms of enhancing the process? We have instituted now for about 10 years what we call a transparent peer review, which is basically to, uh, to publish the referee reports alongside the papers we publish. We don't do open peer review. Uh, we allow referees to sign their reports if they want. But there's a lot of pressure. Um, and in our experience, um, most referees would rather not sign the reports. This is some point we can pick up in the discussion. But we don't make it mandatory to, to sign the reports, but we publish the reports alongside the papers. And this allows, of course, the, the readers to, to track exactly what happened. It opens the black box of the editorial process. Um, it allows the, um, the interested reader to see, to, to see uh, what happened and also to get orthogonal views on the science that's been published. Um, it's also a great teaching tool, so um, I would strongly encourage uh, you in the audience to start to come forward more and, uh, and become referees yourself. One thing that we are uh, not doing very well is to use uh, referees from India and from, from the Asian um, countries. At the, uh, we only use about 5% referees from this area, so this is, um, this is a real problem, and we would like to use more referees. So the best way to learn how to do refereeing properly is to actually look at these reports alongside the papers and see what actually happened. Uh, we also don't reset the publication dates, which many journals still do, and I would encourage you to, uh, to try to go to your favorite journals and change those, those kind of policies, because we need more transparency in showing exactly when we submit and when we publish. It also um, ultimately will give referees the credit for doing the refereeing work, and I'm going to come back to this separately. The other thing we've done, uh, which is extremely uh, powerful, and I would again encourage you, if you are associated with other journals, to try to get them to establish this, is what we call referee cross-commenting. So we're getting the referees to, to look at each other's works, and this is being um, moderated by the, by the handling editor, um, and they can discuss each other's referee reports before those reports are sent to the authors. And this is a very important mechanism to, to um, standardize the process and make sure there's no outlying opinions. And of course, it can go either way that a referee may support a point from another referee that they missed. But more importantly, it also serves to hold back um, excessive points that are raised by maybe one referee which an editor may take to reject a paper. And, and this is extremely uh, useful and powerful, and it doesn't delay the process at all. It delays it by one or two days at most. Um, we've taken this one step further, which is to, uh, to actually involve the authors in the decision making also whenever that uh, seems um, like a useful exercise. So when there's a, not a black and white decision, we send the reports first to the authors and get them to comment on the reports and what they would be prepared to do in revision before they uh, come back to us. And this, this really allows us as editors to, um, to get an agreement with the authors of what essential revision is required and then we will commit to publish the paper if that revision is executed successfully. We also allow double-blind peer review, and we can come back to this in a discussion if you're concerned about um, biases in the refereeing process, which um, often happens uh, 
from countries like India. We allow any format as the mission format, which is something that other journals are starting to do too. There's far too much pain in reformatting and, and sorting out nitty gritty things uh, when, when the process is already so extended. And maybe the most important thing is that we, what we do is uh, what we call scooping protection, which is to um, ensure that once your paper is submitted, that it doesn't matter what else is published elsewhere, that the conceptual advance um, remains unaffected by that. Because we want you to take the time necessary to revise your paper properly and not to do a rush job because something else has come out or even reject the paper based on papers that you couldn't have possibly known about that were done in parallel. Furthermore, we allow uh, reports to be taken up by any other journal. So if we end up not being able to publish a paper, you can take the referee reports to other journals and reuse them there. And I think that's uh, crucially important that you don't have to restart the reviewing process um, if you have to go to another journal, which happens constantly at the moment. So altogether, this allows us to be much more efficient in the editorial process. And you can see that it takes about uh, three days or four days for, for the, your first editorial decision. Then we only send out papers um, at our journals that have a real um, chance in our view to be published. And that process of peer review takes about one month. And that's pr pretty much invariant at all journals um, that I know of. Um, then the, uh, the revision process, crucially, only takes about three months for us. And that's uh, come down from about a year. So basically, uh, by being much more explicit on what revisions we actually require, by pointing out exactly the experiments that are required, uh, we, we ensure that we can be much more efficient in the revision process by having this, this compact, if you want, with the authors. And we end up publishing about 95% of the, uh, the revisions we, we invite. Which, so you have a real commitment at the revision point. Um, another thing that, uh, that we're just starting, and other journals will hope, hopefully also start very soon, is to, um, to uh, make the authorship on papers much more granular. So we move beyond ha just having authors at the top of a paper with some vague um, author contribution statement. We will continue to have that, of course. But we will enhance that by having authorship at the level of each figure panel. So that, and this is entirely voluntary. But it allows uh, you as an author um, that contributed substantially, but that is hidden in the middle of a huge author list to actually pinpoint exactly what experiments you did in a paper. So you get much more granular credit for that. And it, of course, also adds accountability. When something specifically goes wrong with a specific figure, you can then, it's very clear who did that experiment. Uh, Another thing that is important is to start integrating supplementary information back into papers. This may sound like something trivial, but it's remarkable how few people actually look at supplementary information. Um, that includes referees, but in particular readers. So we've decided to actually integrate all supplementary information into papers, and these are called expanded view figures now. So they're collapsed, so you don't get distracted as a general reader um, by lots and lots of figures, but you can expand these case by case. And a huge building site and that, other, that other journals are also working on is uh, the materials and methods section. At the moment, the way we report our materials and methods is particularly um, old-fashioned. We basically have free text. Uh, it's very hard to track exactly what materials were used, what uh, antibodies you used, which lot exactly. Uh, so now we're trying to do this in a much more systematic way, in a structured way. You can see on the right here. And, and this will allow us in the future to, um, to make the uh, papers, we hope, much more reproducible. This, this does make it more work for you as an author, but um, it's really work that's very well invested because the papers you read will also have these method sections and you will waste much less time in trying to reproduce this work. Um, there is a huge issue around reproducibility, which you may be aware of. Uh, we call, in Europe, we call this the reproducibility crisis. Uh, this has been widely reported, and there's now um, some, some um, experiments afoot, actually, to try to quantify how bad the problem is. And you've probably heard about this. This is what's called the cancer test. Um, this is run uh, by a foundation in America. It's been uh, funded um, with several million dollars, actually, and they're trying to replicate 50, the 50 milestone papers in cancer. Um, or fifth, not all 50 milestone papers, but they selected 50 papers that they felt were particularly important. They scaled this down to 38 now, and it costs about $23,000 a paper to try to reproduce each paper. Um, they're a little way through the process. It's much slower than they expected. And uh, I would 
call, um, add a note of caution. This is an interesting experiment to do, but it's very, very hard to interpret the outcome of this experiment. And you can already see they've reported their first findings, which is that um, the first five papers, uh, they could reproduce a couple of them, and for the other three, essentially, they can't really decide if they're reproducible or not. And, and this is, uh, of course, dangerous because the news that may um, come out is that cancer biology is not reproducible any, anymore, or, or that only two out of five papers are reproducible. Let's see what the others turn out to be. But let's say the, uh, this, this rate remains, um, and less than half of the papers end up being fully reproducible. These will be headlines in the New York Times and, and uh, in journals that uh, politicians read and obviously will not inspire confidence in research. But one shouldn't forget that reproducing science is extremely complicated uh, because experiments are very finicky. And while we're trying to improve the materials and methods sections and the way we present our figures, it's, uh, it's extremely difficult. And I think this is a great example to illustrate why, uh, what I'm trying to address. This was a paper that was published by uh, two um, very eminent scientists, Cornelia Polyak and her collaborator, long-time collaborator, Mina Bissell. Um, they simply could not reproduce each other's work, even though they had collaborated for years. They flew regions between uh, each other's labs on the east and west coast of the United States. They flew postdocs between each other's labs, and they couldn't still reproduce the work. And it took them one year to find out that one lab was shaking the bottle and the other one was stirring it, so they clearly hadn't watched their James Bond properly. Um, but, it, uh, but, but that single variable, which you simply could not identify from a materials and methods section, um, did, did ch change the findings dramatically. Uh, so, so this is why this uh, reproducibility initiative is, is uh, going to have a real challenge to try to, um, to, to come to absolute findings. Nonetheless, reproducibility is a major problem. Um, another thing we're very interested about, and we're going to come back to this in the other session, I actually thought this, this, would be, um, this, this talk would, would be afterwards, so, so this may, may be a bit um, out of whack. Uh, it's crucially important to, uh, to give referees more credit for the work they do. Um, and uh, this will enhance the, review, the quality of the reviewing process, and uh, it will ensure that, um, that, that the referees uh, spend the time necessary. And I would draw, like to draw your attention to an, to, uh, to an initiative on the top right here, which is called Pablons, which is, uh, which is a very interesting initiative to try to allow you as a referee to document your work. And we are trying to work with funders now that they take into account your refereeing output in addition to your output as a researcher of your own research papers. Uh, this will hopefully also then come uh, to the refereeing of grants, and this is a crucial element that we have to improve, and we're going to come back to this as part of the, this uh, DORA declaration that I mentioned. Uh, it's crucial that we start ev evaluating scientists um, better at the level of research funding, um, because at the moment we're relying entirely on journals to make these calls. What can you do as, as a researcher to report your work uh, better? you have to report your findings as you found them in an honest and unbiased manner. And this is, I can't emphasize this enough, uh, publishing is not about storytelling, it's about um, uh, reporting your findings in a way that is neutral, that is as unbiased as possible. You have to move this upstream, of course, you have to design your experiments in a way that actually challenges the hypothesis you pose. And this sounds like a, like a no-brainer, but it's actually um, a culture that's really uh, missing from molecular cell biology now. You're not just trying to design experiments that support your favorite hypothesis, you're trying to challenge your hypothesis. Try to ensure that your results definitively support the conclusions you make, of course, and present those results in an unbiased way in your paper. Represent, you can present now in your papers all your replicates and all your findings in a completely transparent way. Here is an example um, of what I would call uh, um, spinning uh, work. In fact, it's an example of, of not spinning your work. So these people uh, found in the New England Journal of Medicine that um, remarkably the, um, the chance of a country to win Nobel Prizes correlates with the average chocolate consumption in the country. And not surprisingly, Switzerland does pretty well on this. Um, and India is not doing all that well. Um, um, but they reported it actually in, in a, a remarkably neutral way. They said, we cannot find a good reason why these two correlate so closely. And you can see this did not lead to the rejection of the paper. It's in the New England Journal of Medicine. So this is a, this is a good example of a, a rather remarkable finding that was um, 
that was reported without any storytelling effect. It was just reported as it was as a correlation, which is probably meaningless, but nonetheless. Here is an example from Amber Reports, where uh, just to illustrate to you how quickly a finding can be, uh, can be mis, uh, misused by the media. So just as a word of caution, that even if you try not to oversell your work in your research paper, it's very, very easy to have it uh, oversold in the media. So this was a paper we published um, a couple of years ago that showed that the cut spur channel was inhibited by about 200 endocrine disrupting agents, which are chemicals like uh, in plastic softeners, which is of course of great interest because they've been linked to fertility in epidemiological studies before. And they showed that these specifically blocked this channel. But it was an entirely in vitro um, um, paper basically that showed the swimming behavior of these um, uh, sperm as an output. And this is the media coverage that ensued. It was a global media event that basically showed um, that toothpaste was, uh, was having you shooting blanks and that basically uh, we were all being made infertile by the industry. So, so this is something that's of course a complete misrepresentation of what this paper actually showed and it's very important that you make sure that when you communicate with the media this is done in a um, very circumspect manner. So please remember not to withhold information. Selective data reporting is a form of misrepresentation. And that's very important because we see this all the time that you cherry pick, not you, um, I'm, I'm using you in a very general sense here, that uh, researchers cherry pick the best findings, um, the three times the experiment worked well and let the two times it didn't work well fall under the table. Not citing accurately is also a form of misrepresentation of intellectual property theft um, because you're trying to oversell your work. Please do remember to add all your source data, that includes replicates, to your actual paper. Um, please deposit your raw data in as far as you can in databases to support your paper. That's crucially important. And here go the slides. Okay. Um, Always remember, always try to reread your paper before you publish this to ensure that other people will be able to reproduce your findings. And make sure this already is in place at submission. Don't wait for the journals to ask you for that. If you find that things go wrong in your paper, please um, do act on it. You cannot just let a paper sit. And this is an example from um, a paper published by a, a postdoc colleague of mine who's now a director in a famous research institute who published a paper uh, showing that PI3 kinase gamma uh, would cause colorectal carcinomas in the knockout mouse. So it was published in 2000 in Nature. It uh, cites quite, uh, it cited very, very well. Um, now he found later, in 2003, three years later, that actually was an um, off-target knockout. And he, uh, what he did was to actually publish a corrigendum that says the tumor phenotype disappeared. It was a, a two-line corrigendum, and that was it. The paper is not retracted, it still is published. And it continues to be cited um, at a very good rate up to this day. So this um, form of corrigendum is, in this case, I would say not sufficient to correct the scientific record because actually it's completely understandable that off-target effects can happen. But if the central conclusions of a paper fall, you have to act on it and retract the paper. Now, it's not always so clear-cut and uh, we've recently had a workshop Oh, it's already a year ago now, where we try to find a consensus between journals to have a more granular way, not to have this black and white corrigendum or retraction, because a retraction is a very dramatic thing to do, of course, because your whole body, the whole body of work is taken down. So we want to have what we call selective retractions. We want to have withdrawals to distinguish from a retraction. A retraction is something where something went wrong, a journal found something, or a reader found something, and the retraction is forced onto the author, whereas withdrawal will be something when author comes forward themselves, like in the previous example, to correct um, a, a, a probably understandable mis mistake in the research. Um, it's very important that you as a PI, but also at whatever level of your career you're in, uh, keep an open lab environment, that people can come forward and discuss openly problems in the experimentation and they're not afraid to report negative findings. Um, there's a huge pressure on, especially on students in the lab, to of course please the PI. And this was something, um, I, I was just in Taiwan, um, where Henry Sun is a PI at, uh, at, at the Academia Sinica, and one thing that he said what I found was nice was that uh, one reason I think people don't do things wrong in my lab is that they show me results that I did not expect. 
So basically, you have to be able, as a PI, to also be open to surprising findings. Don't shoehorn, um, don't have your hypothesis sitting there and uh, wait for your students to support them. But equally also, um, as a student, you have to be able to come forward and show things that, that, that are surprising that didn't work out. And don't uh, fear that you get uh, ignored as a result. So what can we do about data? The, the problem is the way we publish data and papers is entirely um, old-fashioned. We basically focus very much as editors on the text, which is essentially your interpretation of the data, uh, but we have ignored data for far too long. So this is really, in our view, the heart of the paper, and I've put a black box on the figure here because you can really not do very much with the data. To illustrate that here, consider I'm um, publishing a PDF of your um, uh, paper. You essentially um, see a graph in the paper and, what, uh, and you want to measure an outcome. Uh, you actually want to measure the KM, say, from a Michaelis Menten uh, plot. You cannot do that at all. You actually have to um, amplify the, uh, the graph on a Xerox machine and put your woody ruler to it to find out what exactly the um, findings were. You cannot extract that data and replot it. And that's, of course, outrageous in this day and age of online publishing. So what we've done to address this is to have source data link outs in our figures now, and this is entirely voluntary, but we encourage people to add uh, what we call source data, which is the minimal, minimally modified data underlying the figures to each figure. And this can be, of course, for Western blots, such as illustrated here, where you can show the, uh, the uncropped Western blots. You can show as many replicates as you want. Or here on the bottom, you can show the, um, the Excel files that underlie the, um, the graph, the bar chart on the bottom left there. Um, this is something that's crucially important, and more than 60% of our papers now have that. And it allows us to add transparency. It allows you to archive your data, because it's all too often lost, of course, when, uh, once you've published the data. It allows to add replicates and allows reanalysis by others. Reuse. And furthermore, it discourages manipulation of the data because it's much more transparent. Consider this. This is how we normally uh, present bands in our papers now. Um, this is obviously ERC2, as you can imagine, and a famous kinase I used to work on myself. Um, you should recognize the band shape. This is, um, I'm just throwing this there because this you could describe in the text equally well. You could just say, we found that ERC2 was in our um, 293 cells. What we now see often is that people show the ERC2 band like this. This is equally meaningless because it essentially sits on a completely over-contrasted background and actually is more, uh, more of a misrepresentation than the first version I showed you on the left because it's so over-contrasted that it sounds like this anti looks like this antibody is, is entirely specific. When, of course, the experiment looks, looks actually like this. I have to press a little bit more. Could you move it forward? Um, when the experiment, of course, looks like this, where you have a background, you get, probably get some degradation, proteolytic degradation of your protein, which is seen when you expose a bit longer. We also want molecular weight markers, and we want controls in our experiments. This may look a little bit more ugly on the right, but this is a much more meaningful interpretation of the experiment, and you will not get rejected for it. In fact, we strongly encourage that sort of presentation. So when you present your data, please, uh, please ensure that it's not caricaturized. Could you move it on to the next, please? Here's another example from a submission from a very eminent cell biologist in New York City, which, um, and, I'm, and I want to show this because it took us three rounds of increasingly angry email exchanges with that author to, uh, to make them uh, present the data properly. We initially thought this was just actually a, a graph, a, um, an illustration of the findings they had, but actually there was p-values of, of this data, and the claim was that these were real measurements. Anyone working in cell biology knows, of course, that, um, that uh, data is much more noisy normally and that this looked a little bit too good to be true. So we did, in, um, in the end, extract the, the proper data, and it looks like this. Let me go back one. So it looks like this, which, is, um, which has um, large error bars on it, and you can see that the, uh, the four data points that were taken are connected with straight lines as they should be. Uh, this is not just a cosmetic difference, this is actually a very different take-home message that you take as a reader. So I'm illustrating this here because um, this, this is a form of manipulation even though it's not in any way trying to cheat. But it is actually telling a very different story and you have to make sure you present your data um, not in a way where you're telling stories like on the left, but where you're presenting proper data because this is a scientific exercise. 
Now we can present the source data underneath that and you can actually replot your data as you uh, see fit yourself. Uh, there is a huge statistics crisis in molecular cell biology and I'm sure you're much better placed in, in India to, um, to do statistics properly. You have much better training here um, than many in Europe, I think. But uh, we see many, many papers that, are terribly, uh, that have terrible flaws in the statistics. The typical thing we see is on the top here where, where we see the thing on, on the left which is um, nice standard deviations. Um, it looks like you get a really nice peak here. Um, when in fact, of course, the experiment was repeated twice. And, and you see on the right here, this is how we published it in the end. Uh, we still publish the paper, of course. It's completely reasonable to repeat your experiment twice, but it's entirely misleading and wrong. It's scientifically wrong to add standard deviations onto that experiment. Uh, and unfortunately, we see this all the time. People often also don't, um, don't e even uh, describe the statistics. Um, what can also happen, and this didn't happen in this case, but what also happens a lot that, uh, that people measure actually technical replicates rather than biological replicates. When you can see very small error bars, it often means that people actually measured the quality of their Gilson pipette man by, curvet by pipetting five times into cuvettes of, from, from a single sample than actually independent replicates. Now you have to uh, be sure you're aware exactly of, of the difference between technical replicates and biological replicates. I have no time to go into this. It's very different, for example, with mouse experiments um, and cell culture experiments. So we can come, come back to this in the discussion if you're interested. You also have to know what experiment, uh, what statistical tests to apply to your sample. Don't just go into your favorite stats program and play around until you get the smallest error bar you can find, which is illustrated on the left here. The same data set is plotted with different statistical tests, and you can see you can choose your error bar as you like it by using different, different statistical tests. We strongly encourage you to, use, to plot it as it is shown on the left, on the bottom left here, as a, as a um, cloud of, of data points, you can still add your statistics to that. But this is by far the most transparent way to show it. And when you get very small effects, please don't uh, overinterpret your data. As on the bottom right here, this is a real example um, from a few years ago now, where somebody um, said they had a 99.8 plus minus 01 difference. Uh, they repeated the experiment a ton of times, so this is a really, um, they tried really hard to get a difference. And they say themselves, this was statistically significant, but minimal. But um, how you make conclusions from this sort of um, statement, I don't know. They try to. This was in the abstract. Okay. And statistics is, uh, let, let me move on. Statistics is a really big issue now. You, you probably know that uh, various statisticians, in particular John Ioannidis, has claimed that most biological data published is in fact wrong based on the, this misapplication of statistics. So it's crucially important that we get this right. Now, a few points about ethics, and I have to move on a bit. Um, we we um, do try to screen much more diligently about, um, about ethical abuse in our papers. And on the left here, I want to show you one example. Again, this is, there's no intent in any way in this paper to, um, to do things wrong. And this is actually a good illustration of how difficult things are. This was a paper we published uh, from Germany where they um, found a really uh, remarkable um, um, antagonist to a receptor in, in um, it's, it's a fish toxin that basically blocks a pain receptor in humans. And, uh, and this, uh, this receptor causes um, changes uh, its perception of cold into intense uh, heat, basically. Uh, and this, is, uh, this comes from a fish in Australia. This was known for 300 years already, this toxin. Um, and they identified exactly the, the mechanism of action. Now, they try to illustrate the, the power of their findings by uh, doing the figure, in figure 1F, they did the experiment on their own postdocs in the lab. Um, and it went up to 8 out of 10 uh, maximal imaginable pain. <laughs> um, now, this was, of course, a very flamboyant, and it really um, shows how remarkable these findings are. But in most countries of the world, this experiment is entirely illegal. Uh, in Germany, it was not, actually, turns out, because they all signed declarations that they wanted to do this experiment. But, but in countries like the US, this would not be allowed because there's a dependency relationship between the postdocs and the PI. So, so this is uh, to illustrate there was, no, there, there was no intent to do anything wrong, but this figure was something that we, uh, that we removed and we published the paper very happily without it. But when you do experiments, you have to make sure you, um, 
you basically fulfill international guidelines, not just your national guidelines. Uh, where we see many problems is at the level of image integrity, and I want to show you a few examples of that. Uh, plagiarism is another, is the third big element. We don't see many problems with plagiarism, but we can come back to that, so I'm not going to dwell on that. With plagiarism, I should just make one point. Uh, if you don't know what the, what the issue of uh, what self-plagiarism means, we, um, please bring it up in the discussion. That's something that's not <clears throat> really well understood. Self-plagiarism is basically republishing <clears throat> your own text over and over. This is not something we, uh, we, we condone in journals. But now a few points about image manipulation. As you can see here, Photoshopping has become a, um, a standard practice across all, all human endeavors. Basically, this is on Deutsche Bahn. And I'm, I'm, I'm in Heidelberg in Germany. And you can see that Deutsche Bahn is playing with Photoshop. Uh, this is meant to be a real-life image of, this, of your train as you're sitting in the train speeding along. It shows you the speed of the train. Uh, but you immediately see that there's something wrong here because the image is actually taken between the tracks and you should be extremely worried um, if, the, if you are actually riding the train between the tracks. What they, of course, did is to, um, to duplicate the two tracks here. If you see the left and the right, they flip them around and then they change the background a little bit to make it look like a real photograph. Um, so this is happening everywhere. This is happening in Bollywood films where blemishes are removed from people's faces, um, et cetera, et cetera. And now, the problem is it happens in science just as much, and this is, of course, where things are, um, become a real problem. Could you move it on? Okay. And uh, this does happen not just by scientists. When I was at Nature, we published uh, Dolly the Sheep, and as, as you know, in China, we, we now just saw the cloning of, of the first two, um, two uh, monkeys. Um, when we cloned Dolly, we actually, unfortunately, <clears throat> the, uh, the illustrator that rendered the cover, unfortunately, made a dramatic mistake. And I'm not sure if you're able to see what happened. Um, there's, there's something very strange about this image. Um, if you look more carefully, you'll probably see that one of the legs looks rather different to the other legs. It looks somewhat obscene, even. Could, could you move it forward? Please one. Um, of course, they took the leg of Dolly's brother instead of Dolly's fourth leg. So, so this is a typical sort of example that, uh, that, that, that can happen very easily. Now, when this happens at, at the level of data, of course, we have a real problem. So we would strongly encourage you to use ImageJ, not Photoshop, when, you, when you're rendering your images, um, because it's a much more robust uh, program to use. And I want to show you a few examples of image manipulation that went uh, really to dramatic uh, extents. You probably know about this paper. This was the first really extreme um, um, uh, fraud paper. And it all came out of the, uh, this was Wo Sok Wung's um, first um, report of cloning. And it led to, uh, to a very, very dramatic outcome. He was basically, um, that affected the whole of Korean science. I'm trying to move the slides forward. Uh, that affected the whole of Korean science for many, many years. Uh, and it was uncovered by, uh, initially by this duplication in the supplementary information of one of the figures, where they basically duplicated one cell colony, and they uh, didn't completely duplicate it. They used a different, in fact, a different um, view of the same colony. But that's how it was initially uncovered. Um, as you probably know by now, that uh, everything else went wrong in this research project that you can possibly imagine. Um, so I'm not going to have time to go into the details. But one of the things that went wrong was authorship. And I just wanted to point out that it's very important when you're an author on a paper that you're aware that you are fully responsible as, um, wherever you are on the authorship list for all of the contents of the paper. So you really have to make sure you're completely aware of your colleague, what your colleagues and collaborators are doing. Now, Jerry Shutton here on the right um, quickly distanced himself from his co-authorship on the papers in the end by saying that he only translated the paper into better English, um, even though he was the second corresponding author on the paper. And this is, of course, extremely embarrassing and uh, it would not have justified authorship at all. Now, a few points about image manipulation. Um, this is the things we look for. We're now doing systematic image screening in our uh, journals. And uh, we find a huge number of problems. And I want to spend a, just a few minutes on this to illustrate um, the types of problems we see. We see duplication. So this is an image of, of Hiroshige, oops, which I misspelled. Hiroshige, and this was later repainted by Van Gogh, which you can see in the middle image here. 
inserted in the middle image. Um, what we see is that people splice together different experiments that were done on different days, which I'm illustrating in the middle there with the splicing. Um, so Van Gogh painted his painting uh, about 20 or 30 years after Hiroshige. Now he completely attributed his painting to Hiroshige, so this was not plagiarism, by the way. But if you splice these together, then of course you have an entirely meaningless result because you're splicing together experiments that were done at different times and you're, 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 you're pretending that you can make a quantitative comparison between these experiments. What we also see is that people um, insert information as on the right here, this, you see this red box. People insert information to blot out unwanted uh, findings or to, uh, to, in, to include wanted findings. They may also duplicate findings, as you see from the left to the, to the very right there. Um, and sometimes they flip things, they stretch things, they change the contrast of, of their images to try to obfuscate that. We see a huge number of duplications within papers, and we don't really understand why that happens, because, of course, you have many other experiments in your draw that you could use. But nonetheless, we see all these duplications. So here are a few examples. This is something that's purely, um, that's a purely what we would call beautification. It's, it's nothing um, that, is, uh, that is cheating. It's purely beautification. You can probably see this by eye. This is a typical rendering of three, three um, cells in a, in a figure that are meant to be representative of a, of a finding. But what they did is they actually um, move down one, the cell to, from the top right to the bottom left. Um, this is, of course, you can immediately see, because the cell is actually still there on the top right, that this was the same experiment. And they simply wanted, they somehow fancied this arrangement of the three cell nuclei. They thought it was aesthetically more pleasing and moved it down. This is a form of manipulation. Of course, it's, it's uh, really beautification. We did not retract the paper. We published the thing on the, uh, the, 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 proper, the proper figure in the end. But uh, don't do that sort of thing. It's, it, if it's found after publication, it can um, cause a lot of distrust of your paper. So this is what I would call the lowest level of image problems we find. This is sort of akin to, um, to moving um, islands around on maps, which is what happens. We have, a, we have two editors from Denmark, and they're always very upset that in the weather reports, one of them comes from the island of, of Bornholm on the bottom right there, and she's always very upset because in the weather reports they move this into Sweden. So this is, this is exactly the sort of thing that you saw with the cell. Now something more dramatic is this, uh, and, and this is to uh, the dying day of this very famous researcher, he, he refused to understand what the problem here was. You can't see a problem here, but if you do some image enhancement, you see that actually they pitched, they, they spliced together cell colonies from all over the place. And he said this is completely standard practice. He's done this for 30 years. He doesn't see why he should change that now. He's obviously um, not moved the things around. He just removed noise from the background to, dis to avoid distracting the reader. But if you look more carefully on the second image from the left on the top, you actually see that the background is very different. So we have no evidence at all that this wasn't spliced together from different experiments. Just don't touch your experiments. This is already a much uh, worse type of manipulation, even though in this case we are quite confident it was just beautification. Or here you have another example and uh, where you really have to wonder if this can still be called beautification. You don't see anything by naked eye. These are, this is a DNA repair paper with, uh, with, cell new, with DNA stained for, for um, damage sites. Uh, but if you do image enhancement, you see that they actually blotted out uh, about half the, uh, half the image in this paper, uh, in these panels. Uh, now, when you uncover this, you notice that it's actually a cell debris that was, uh, that was camouflaged here. But of course, this is not just cosmetic. Cell, cell debris indicates that the cells in this culture dish were dying, and it will change your interpretation. So this is actually fraudulent, a fraudulent manipulation. That's very serious. Okay, so for us it's extremely difficult when we do these routine screens to make a judgment between manipulation and beautification, uh, beautification and outright fraud. But you can uh, see that the outcome is extremely different. With fraud, you will basically have your paper retracted, we will report it to your institution, and you may actually lose your job. Um, here, one more illustration to show to you how complicated this is. You can immediately see these are, these are probably uh, western blots or northern blots. 
Um, and the, this is extremely grainy and over-contrasted, so it's, it's pretty poor quality. If you look a little bit more carefully, you can probably see that these um, lanes are actually extremely similar. Lane 6 and 7 in particular, but also 11, look almost identical. And I say almost because there's a couple of pixels which are different. So if they're identical, they actually took care to make them slightly different too. You, you can probably see the, um, a couple of differences too. But when you look even more carefully, you see that, they, that some of the background is cloned itself too. So some of these, um, this, background, this background noise is pixel identical, which shows that they took immense care to make this, um, this data look real by cloning background. That means the data is essentially completely invented as far as I'm concerned, and we pull the whole paper because we've lost trust in all of the, this person's output. We will report this to the institution, and uh, we, we, we think this is, this is, this is um, completely unethical. So we look routinely now at all of our figures, and we find that about 20% 20 of our figures, despite doing this now for five years, um, still contain image manipulations of the three different levels that I showed you. Most of them, unfortunately, are this cosmetic type, which we can completely rectify. And less than half a percent are this extreme um, stuff that I showed you at the end. Uh, the outcomes of this, and I'm going to stop talking in just a second so we have a time for, for, for discussion, but the outcome of this is, um, can be very dramatic. This is Shinya Yamanaka, who won the Nobel Prize for IPS cells, as you know. Um, there's, there's a bit of a vigilante culture now of people reporting all kinds of manipulations that they claim to find in papers. And somebody whistleblowed on him and said there's two bands in his um, EMBO journal, his last first author paper in EMBO journal in 2000, that were identical. You can see them on the top left here, and they asked us to retract the paper and, and basically name and shame Shinya Yamanaka. Now, we looked at this in, su in some detail. Uh, unfortunately, Shinya did not have the source data um, available. The paper was a little bit older, of course, as you can see. Um, always keep your source data. Uh, but these bands are also not completely identical and then very nondescript. So we came to the conclusion there's no definitive evidence at the resolution published that the bands are cloned. And we didn't do anything about it. So we have always a presumption of innocence. And this is absolutely crucial. When you go and whistleblow, it's crucial that you don't just point out anything that could be possibly wrong, but that you're quite confident that there's a problem. Because the outcome was really dramatic. There was an international press frenzy around this because Nobel Prize winner is now fraudster. Of course, he is not, I emphasize. There's absolutely zero evidence that anything went wrong at all. But he didn't have his source data, so he couldn't prove him prove it. And this is what he said. He was, uh, he was extremely sorry and he learned his lesson to keep his source data. So please do keep your source data. As you probably know, uh, another case from Japan recently um, where the stab cell, the stress-activated uh, stem cells, uh, which turned out to be a completely fraudulent um, experiment, this would have also been uncovered um, by routine image screening check because um, there was four different problems in the image uh, in the images of this paper, and if it had been undertaken at the journal, um, it would have probably been found out before the dramatic if events, which you probably know, uh, led to um, human tragedy in this case, because the PI uh, in the end committed uh, suicide. Uh, and I just wanted to use this as an example that that the consequences of what uh, what you do wrong is can be really quite dramatic. And I think I'm going to stop there because I need to. First of all, I can't move on. Um, okay, maybe one, one more point to make it. Um, despite this image manipulation, the image manipulations that we detected in that paper uh, were not dramatic. They were very similar to what we find in other papers too. It took more than one year of extra work that cost over $1 million to actually prove that the experiments were fraudulent by doing deep sequencing on all the cell cultures. So this is a huge investment of extra money, of research funding to find out things. And I'm going to stop here, and um, here's a few guidelines of rendering your images, and I would rather like to take um, any questions you may have, or comments, please. Maybe can you turn up the lights a little bit so I can see if there's... Thank you, Bernard. Oh, try to keep it far away. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. It was a really exciting and interesting uh, talk. I had two uh, questions. One is, when do you do this uh, image analysis? Is it only when a reviewer prompts you that there is something fishy or it's a ah. standard practice? And the other question is, 
is there a space for a video blogging or like, I mean, we are publishing more content than we can see in our lifetime, but why not we publish uh, the video logging or yeah. video journal of the experiments? Yeah, yeah, Thank so you. that's that's two uh, very good points. So the first point is we, we're doing our image screening at the moment, actually, um, uh, after peer review. So basically when a paper, when we're almost certain we're going to publish a paper, we, we do the screening because it takes about one hour per paper and it's simply not scalable to do at all submissions. We only publish about 10% of the submitted papers at our journals. But we're working on automation of some of this screening and we're quite far down the road for that actually. We can detect most of the type of manipulations I showed you now automatically. Um, and at this point, we will do it at first submission, the screening. But at the moment, we don't have the resourcing to do it at the beginning. Um, of course, it would be much, much better to do that at the beginning to save referees from papers that are, have real problems from, from having to do the job. The, this is usually not found out by referees, and we wouldn't expect them to look at these sort of things because refereeing is, is a very different exercise than looking for... For, for image manipulation. On the second point is, um, and of course the problem with automation is that then it can be used to, um, to cheat better also. So we are quite nervous about, about all, all of these things, but, but nonetheless. The, the, the second point is, is about video um, um, materials and methods. And we are very, very positive about that. So by all means, take a video. If you, are, if you have a finicky experiment, I totally agree with you. The best way to actually capture it is, is by simply filming yourself. And we want to do this much more systematically. There's actually a journal called Jove, which is, which is um, capturing, which is specializes in videos. But we see no reason why you can't just add, embed a little video in your materials and methods section. So by all means, do, do that. You, you can already do that with, with our journals. And it doesn't have to be high resolution. You can just film yourself. You just do a selfie. Because some of these variables you simply cannot capture on, by, by describing it in free text. Thanks very much. Any other comments? So uh, I just wanted to ask, is there any you know, uh, specific time frame within which if an author is asked to you know, give raw data and he cannot produce it, then that leads to you know, you know, certain action? Yeah, yeah. So, like so, so when you say four years, also, five years, so, so, so you mean a reader? If a reader writes into us and say they cannot reproduce yeah. a piece of, of data we published, yeah, something like that. Like, yeah, in the context of like a certain in certain cases we have limited storage capacities. So, mm. what is there any standard time frame <laughs> till which we must store all raw data for a particular manuscript? Oh, sorry, that way around. You mean? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, so there is no standard time frame. The usual um, time frame that is that is seen as reasonable as 10 years at the moment. Okay. But I would say that is already an old-fashioned comment because nowadays you can keep it forever. I, I would say there's no reason not to keep almost all your data for, forever. Now, now, let's be clear about this. You cannot keep all your raw data forever because it's simply way too much. I, I don't know what type of science you work in, but uh, if you work in imaging, for example, there's absolutely no way you can keep all your raw data. But you can keep what I would call source data, which is the data you used that's underlying the figures in your paper. Mm -hmm. um, we encourage you to publish this in our papers, as I said, anyway. Uh, but, but please do keep that, I would say, forever, because you, you simply don't know when it will become important. If somebody finds a problem, like with Shinya Yamanaka, 15 years after publication, and he threw the, the data away after 10 years, and the data we published is low resolution, you know, he, he found himself having to publicly apologize for having destroyed his data when it was just a Western blot. He could have just kept, you know, that one photograph. Uh, so I, I would say keep it forever as far as possible. Yeah, I was actually referring to the exact raw data, not the source data. Yeah, okay. yeah. I so think that so with raw it. data, I completely agree. It, yeah. If you're doing um, mass spec or something, there's absolutely yeah. no way you, you can keep all the raw data. And in fact, it's, it's not very meaningful to, to do so. But do try to keep the source data. Okay, yeah, that explains a lot. Thank you. There's one in the in the back. Yeah. So I was thinking that whenever we read some papers, we always think that this is a substrate story. Can we make a platform where a person can put the re re experiment which are not conclusive or some sort of yeah, a limitation? Yeah. Thank you. Because That's, it's very important yeah. to get the holistic 
uh, idea of the entire yeah. hypothesis. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's also a very, very good comment. And we, I think we're going to come back to this in the other session. <clears throat> Actually, uh, there, there is a session on open science. <clears throat> You're absolutely right. The journals, <clears throat> and journals such as ours, we're selecting brutally for what we call conceptually advanced. So, so if you have negative data, it's extremely hard to get into the EMBO journals. And in fact, we just launched a fifth journal called Life Science Alliance, which is specifically trying to publish the types of data that you refer to because some of these um, pieces of data are crucially important. So negative data can be absolutely, uh, uh, can be very, very important too. So we're trying to be very selective at this journal Life Science Alliance for quality, but we don't select for, for what we call conceptual advance or novelty traditionally, okay? Uh, obviously, uh, another very important platform that I will mention in this open science session is called uh, preprint publication, which you may have heard about. So there's now a, a several uh, servers. Um, one, the most famous one is called BioArchives. So this is something, a concept we took from the physical sciences community where we, you can basically post your papers your, or your manuscripts or even smaller units of science, like individual figures, um, in a preprint form where it's not peer-reviewed, but it's stable, it's citable, and you can get credit, academic credit for it in principle, not yet, but in principle. Um, so this is a great platform, I think. We don't have to publish everything in the form of research papers. We need to find ways, and this is what we call open science, we need to find new mechanisms to share information beyond the traditional research paper. So I would all encourage you to try to use preprints. Uh, we can discuss if you have questions about preprints also. Um, at what point do you consider a submission uh, as so much self uh, plagiarized that it can't be accepted? So, sorry, could you repeat that? I didn't... Uh, this question is regarding self plagiarism. So at ah. what point do you consider a submission so much self plagiarized that it can't be accepted? In that form. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so self. So, so this is something that's that's very complicated. Um, the the most extreme example of self plagiarism. I, I have a couple of slides on this. Is when people actually republish their review five times. So, so we will we will go. Um, we have we have several examples of this to a famous scientist and say, why don't you write a review on this and this exciting topic? And then they will simply send us a review they wrote five years ago and <laughs> want to republish it. That's what we call self plagiarism. And it's essentially useless to republish the same piece of information. Um, they obviously do it because we ask them, but they also sometimes do it to get more credit for it. So that's extreme. What, what we have excluded from plagiarism completely, and that's an important point, and I would encourage you again to lobby journals to do that, is the materials and methods sections. So we were quite happy for you to cut and paste your methods again and again in the same way because it's simply ridiculous to expect you to have a new formulation for every time you do your Western blood experiment. So, so that's, that's one thing. The other thing is, is to, that you have to be very circumspect because plagiarism is not just um, a cutting and pasting of the same text. It's also about concepts. So if, if you take a finding you had before and you, you write it up in different texts and you don't reference your previous work, that is still plagiarism, even though the text is different. Okay, so it's not just the duplication of the text, it's the concept that you can plagiarize too. So, so just to be, to be very clear, always reference, and if, if you're worried that, that a quotation that you're actually taking the same text, especially from somebody else, always put it, put it in quotation marks. So it's very clear, this was taken from reference so-and-so, and it's a quotation of somebody else. If you're quoting yourself, you don't have to put it in, in, in quotation marks, really. But always reference. Crucially important. 